Today we will study Kopo Jutsu. The word Kopo has two kanji. Hone, also read as Kotsu, that means bone, and the Ho, that means method. The junction of both of them is pronounced as Kopo, that could be abstractly understood as method of the bones. The translation for another language than the Japanese, however, generally referred to Kopo as attack on the bones or even to bone. Although the second characteristics sustain this translation, the study of the nomenclature in its original form usually gives another understanding to the one who is studying it. It's interesting to alert that the same word kopo, uh, with the composition of the same kanji, may have the meaning neck, or some sort of ability, special talent, and this definition, specifically in our school, has never been taught or been referred to the kopo jutsu. Yet in many forms, including the classical forms of Seite Gata, are very common attacks to the fingers, wrists, and elbows. Uh, thoughts thought subsequently strongly indicate the attacks to shoulder, scapulas, articulations of the leg, and uh, other attacks aiming a strong impact directly to the bone, uh, studied in specific form of Atene Jutsu, uh, used in Kopo Jutsu. Being an art considered difficult, Regarding executing it perfectly, the diversity of the aimed targets comes with the exposure that the enemy makes of his body. It is characteristic of Kopo, the chain of fractures or luxations, often in the same bone or articulation, but under different angles and thus different traumas. It is also interesting to note that in Kopo and also in Jujutsu, the artifices that give the condition to perform a technique. For example, when one holds the kimono of the uke, the hand goes in the back of the eri or lapel and compresses the clavicle and the sternocleidomastoid, attempting to inhibit the elaboration of bilateral contraction uh, in the sternocleidomastoid and making it difficult uh, the flexion or the extension of the head. Research for the bias of understanding and analysis and understand some of the causalities of a movement and not only tend to perform it and check the results in the end. We should remember that a technique is only valid and everyone can use it, otherwise it's a phenomenon, and we're not interested in that. Instead, we're interested in the points of efficiency under the conditions they are related to. For that, we have to know some of the principles present in Kopo. Since we are studying a classical art, it is important to know some of the historical features regarding its structure. Kopo was developed essentially to be used against an opponent armed with a katana or sword, and subsequent studies include attacks with tanto, or the Japanese knife, and free-handed attacks. For that, and for the fact that it was applied very quickly and caused horrible damages, there is a theory that states that Kopo is a subdivision of Jujutsu, and later on it influenced like Jujutsu. There are many controversial points. One of them is related to the names of the techniques of Kopo and the way they are referred. Actually, there are no names and they are referred as sequences of study, completely differently from the very specific names that Jujutsu has. Anyway, there are other arguments for and against both sides of each theory. Within our school, Kopo is seen as a specific study that has its origins in Jujutsu. In a broad outline, what characterizes Kopo is a form of study that leads specifically to damages in the bones and articulations. The Kamae Siunyun Kopo, that is, the initial position that leads the movements, could never be the same as in Aiki Jujutsu, Jujutsu, Kenpo, or any other form of taijutsu, the, the corporal forms, precisely because it has its own peculiarities. The kamai has to propitiate a structure that makes easier the action of the body. In the case of kopo, one attempts to intelligently use the points of the body as weapons. Elbows, shoulders, knees, heels, and every point is accentuated. Under the opposite vision of the enemy, such a condition turns the other into a dangerous target when the bodies are in a short distance. 
The base is centered and the fingers are a bit closed, not completely closed in order to not generate tension, but also not opened so the attack on the fingers is not facilitated. The knees must be bent so that this gives stability to the hips. We will study later on that it will support nearly everything. As the center of mass is not empirically lowered, it is possible to move with relative ease, in which case, on the other hand, does not bring a characteristic of great stability or explosion from the lower in part of the body. This can be explained by the physics as by the exercise physiology and the biomechanics. In the physics, one can describe the position of the center of mass of the system as being the average position of the system's mass. It's seen as a special point since it moves as if all the mass of the system were concentrated at that point. Also, in the physics, there is a concept that as lower the center of mass, or CM, gets, the more stable it becomes. This explanation, even though it's very often used in the martial arts, should be well considered so we do not fall into some common mistakes. One of them is to think that the CM uh, coincides with the Hara. The CM depends on the geometry of the body in question, since the geometry may significantly change the mass's distribution. The CM may coincide with the Hara in some particular cases. These variations of the CM, although may be seen as small, might represent great part of the correct fit of a technique. In each art, this can be seen and felt differently and with different consequences.